Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. My dad became paraplegic when I was just seven years old. A drunk driver changed our lives forever that night. But my dad, he never let it slow him down. Within a year, he was back to working, driving, and living life to the fullest with his specially modified car. The only thing he really needed was those designated handicapped parking spots. They gave him enough space to maneuver his wheelchair in and out of the car. This story happened back in the late 1990s in South Africa. The local mall had become our weekend sanctuary. The security guards knew us well. They'd often help my dad with his wheelchair when I wasn't around. Plus, they always kept an eye on his designated spot, knowing how crucial it was for him. That Saturday started like any other. We were heading to catch a movie, looking forward to our usual father-son time. But as we pulled up to our regular spot, there it was. A police car parked right in the handicapped space. No emergency, no visible reason. Just there. My dad, being the clever man he is, simply smiled and parked directly behind the police car. We weren't blocking the road, just that one spot. He knew exactly what he was doing. I asked my dad if he was sure about doing this. He just replied wisely that sometimes people needed to learn things the hard way. We went about our day, watched our movie, had a leisurely lunch, and really took our time. About five hours later, we were heading back to the car. Dad stayed behind to pay for parking while I went ahead to get the car ready. That's when I met our steaming friend in blue. Picture a red-faced man built like a buffalo, wearing a police uniform that looked two sizes too small. He stormed up to me like a charging rhino. He demanded to know if this was my car, and I calmly confirmed that it was. What followed was the most impressive display of creative cursing I'd ever witnessed. Spittle flew everywhere as he went through every swear word in the English language, probably invented some new ones too. He plastered about 20 parking tickets all over our windscreen. Mind you, we didn't have our handicap sign displayed at the time. I just stood there smiling, waiting for the grand finale. And boy, did it deliver. My dad wheeled himself around the corner, and I swear I heard the officer's jaw hit the ground. The color drained from his face so fast you'd think he'd seen a ghost. The officer immediately started stammering and stumbling over his words, trying to explain himself. My dad cut him off, asking him pointedly about illegally parking in a handicapped spot while giving tickets to others. The officer tried to defend himself by saying he only needed to quickly visit the pharmacy. He started frantically ripping the tickets off our windscreen, but my dad stopped him. When my dad asked what he thought he was doing with those tickets, the officer nervously explained that he could make them disappear. My dad responded that he'd actually love to keep them, saying a judge would be very interested in seeing how an officer of the law handles parking violations while committing one himself. The officer looked like he was about to faint. He started pleading, mentioning his family and worrying about his superior. My dad responded that he had a family too, and pointed out that every time the officer parked in that spot, another person with a disability had to struggle unnecessarily. When my dad asked how many times he'd done this before, the officer's silence was deafening. My dad then laid out his terms. He explained that we'd keep the tickets, not to file them, but as a reminder. He warned the officer that if we ever saw his car in this spot again, these tickets and today's security footage would find their way to his superior officer. The officer quickly agreed, profusely apologizing. My dad simply told him not to be sorry, but to be better. The mall security guards who had gathered to watch the show were trying hard not to laugh. They'd known us for years, and seeing this officer get his Come uppance was probably the highlight of their month. As we drove home that day, I noticed how the officer's car had mysteriously relocated to the regular parking area. I've been teaching third grade for the past seven years at the local elementary school. It's not the highest paying job, but seeing those little faces light up when they finally understand something makes it all worth it. It was a regular Wednesday afternoon. I was gathering my things after dismissal when I heard thundering footsteps in the hallway. Before I could even look up, my classroom door burst open 
and this wild-eyed woman stormed in, her face red with rage. She immediately started screaming, demanding to know where the person was who had hurt her baby. I was alone in the classroom, confused and startled by her sudden appearance. I politely asked if I could help her. She walked right up to my desk, pointing her finger in my face. She accused me of playing dumb and claimed her son had told her everything. She was convinced I was the one who had pushed him down and hurt him. I stood up trying to maintain my composure while keeping my desk between us. I calmly told her that I would never hurt a student and asked which child was hers. Instead of answering, she lunged across my desk and grabbed a fistful of my hair, yanking me forward. The pain was shocking and I screamed, more from surprise than anything else. She kept screaming about how I'd hurt her precious baby boy and how I deserved to be fired. Our school security officer heard the commotion and rushed in. He immediately called for backup while trying to get this woman to release me. She was so caught up in her rage that it took both him and another teacher to pry her fingers from my hair. She continued screaming, accusing all of us of covering for me. She insisted that I had beaten up her son and demanded we look at what she claimed I had done to him. That's when I noticed a boy standing in the doorway, maybe 10 years old with scraped knees, torn pants and some nasty bruises on his face. I'd never seen him before in my life. He wasn't even one of my students. The police arrived quickly and while they were questioning everyone, the truth came tumbling out. The poor kid couldn't take it anymore and broke down crying. Through his tears, he confessed that he had fallen off his bike. He explained that he hadn't been watching where he was going and hit the curb. He admitted that he had been too scared to tell his mother the truth because she always got so angry when he messed up his clothes or broke things. The look on Karen's face shifted from rage to shock, then to something darker when she turned to her son. She called him a liar and berated him for embarrassing her in front of everyone. She tried to lunge at her son, but the police officers held her back. That's when things got even more serious. Her reaction to her son's confession set off every red flag possible for the officers. They arrested her for assault against me and called Child Protective Services right there on the spot. During the investigation that followed, the boy's father's parents, his grandparents, came forward. They had been trying to get custody of their grandson for years, documenting Karen's explosive temper and the suspicious bruises their grandson would sometimes have. This incident was the final piece of evidence they needed. The court proceedings moved surprisingly fast. I pressed charges for assault, and with the school security footage, the witness statements, and her behavior in front of law enforcement, she didn't stand a chance. She was sentenced to anger management classes, community service, and two years of probation. She also lost custody of her son. I saw the boy about six months later when his grandmother brought him to thank me. Even though I was initially a victim of their family drama, they said my case helped them finally get him away from his mother. He was like a different child, smiling, relaxed, and actually looking like a kid should look. His grandmother told me how much better he was doing. She explained that he was in therapy, making friends, and his grades had improved tremendously. She expressed profound gratitude for my decision to press charges, saying it had finally forced the system to see what was really happening. The boy apologized sincerely for lying about me, explaining that he had just been so scared of his mother. I assured him that I was just glad he was safe now, and that was what mattered most. I later learned that Karen violated her probation by trying to visit her son at his new school resulting in a restraining order and some jail time. Meanwhile, her son is thriving with his grandparents. He joined the school's science club, started playing soccer, and from what his grandmother tells me, he hasn't had a single nightmare in months. Sometimes I think about how one lie told out of fear led to such chaos, but ultimately resulted in saving that child from an abusive situation. While I wouldn't want to relive getting my hair yanked out by an enraged parent, knowing that kid is finally safe and happy makes every moment of that ordeal worth it. My grandmother was an incredible woman who lived in a beautiful house in Florida. She passed away last year, and that's when everything started going downhill. My mother became the executor of the estate, and honestly, we were all just trying to process our grief 
while dealing with the mountain of paperwork and responsibilities that come after someone dies. My mother hired my grandmother's old lawyer to handle the estate, which turned out to be our first mistake. Now I can see how disinterested and unhelpful he was, but we were too overwhelmed to notice at first. About a month after my grandmother's passing, while we were still sorting through her belongings and dealing with funeral arrangements, these neighbors, who, mind you, lived six houses down, decided to stick their noses in our business. They went ahead and paid the property tax on my grandmother's house before we could. We didn't think much of it at first since we had bigger things to worry about. But then things got weird. Really weird. These neighbors started claiming they had a right to the house because they paid one property tax bill. One. Single. Bill. Even though we'd been paying all the taxes since then. One day my mother got a call from them. The neighbors started by telling my mother they needed to discuss the house, claiming they had a legal right to it now. When my mother asked what they were talking about and reminded them it was her mother's house, they had the nerve to say that because they paid the property tax that one time, they were technically part owners now. My mother told them how ridiculous that was, pointing out that you can't claim ownership just by paying one tax bill. That's when they dropped another bombshell, saying they had actually bought the house from my grandmother and paid her in coins. When my mother asked about these supposed coins, they just said they were gold coins and that they had receipts showing they bought them. When my mother pressed for proof that my grandmother had actually received these coins, all they could offer were some vague text messages where she apparently acknowledged receiving something and they said their family members could testify about it. The whole thing was absurd. They couldn't even specify what kind of coins they supposedly gave my grandmother. All they had were receipts showing they bought some coins, not even proof that they gave them to anyone. But it gets better. I did some digging and discovered their son was actually living in my grandmother's house. They had just moved him in there like they owned the place. And if that wasn't enough, they were using the house's address for some mysterious business that I couldn't find any information about when I searched online. Then they came up with this brilliant proposal. They told us they didn't want to go to court and suggested we just sell the house and split the money 50-50. My mother, bless her heart, was actually considering it because our useless lawyer wasn't giving us any real guidance. That's when I stepped in and started investigating. I discovered they had tried to file some paperwork with the county to transfer the property to them. When I checked the county records, I found that as of February 2024, the deed had been properly transferred to my mother through a personal representative's distributive deed. I also uncovered that not only was their son living there, but their brother had moved in too. No lease, no agreement, just straight up squatting. And they had the audacity to register my grandmother's house as their business address. That's when I took action. I found a new lawyer who actually knew what they were doing and things started moving quickly. The police were called to remove the squatters and our new lawyer filed all the necessary paperwork to protect our rights to the property. The neighbors tried to produce some document they had typed up themselves, claiming it was a purchase agreement, but it was completely invalid. They couldn't even prove they had paid the amount they claimed they would in their own fake document. The finale was beautiful. Our new lawyer sent them a cease and desist letter and the police showed up to evict their relatives. The business they registered at the address was investigated for fraud and they ended up having to pay back all the taxes we had paid plus legal fees. They were trying to sell their own house and move away. Guess they couldn't handle living six houses down from the place where their grand scheme fell apart. My wife and I have been married for eight years and for the most part, things were good. We had three beautiful children, two boys aged six and four, and a baby girl who we lost in 2021 when she was just one year old. Her passing devastated us, but we tried to move forward the best we could. After our daughter's death, we received a life insurance payout. Instead of letting that money sit in the bank, we decided to invest it in something meaningful, land. We found two beautiful parcels in Minnesota totaling about an acre. The plan was to build our dream home there, something to give our boys a fresh start and honor their sister's memory. I landed a great job with a federal government contractor in manufacturing 
which meant we could finally start planning the house. That's when everything started falling apart. I was reviewing house plans for a four-bedroom home, one master bedroom for us, one room each for our boys, and an extra room for a playroom game room. I was excited to show my wife the plans before submitting them to the town hall for approval. When she saw the plans, she immediately questioned why there were only four bedrooms. I explained the layout, one for us, one for each of the boys, and a playroom. She then asked where her family would be staying. Confused, I asked her what she meant. That's when she dropped the bomb. She had already promised her siblings they could live with us once the house was built. I was shocked and asked her when this was decided. She defended herself by saying they were family and needed a place to stay, and she had already promised them. I told her she couldn't make promises about our house without discussing it with me first. She then accused me of only caring about myself and not considering her or her family. When I said that I never agreed to this and that this was our home for our children, she threatened to sell the land to prove her point. She had gone behind my back, made promises to her siblings without consulting me, and now was threatening to sell our land, land we bought with our daughter's life insurance money. The next day, I got a call from the town's registrar. He told me they had been receiving ownership change inquiries about our land parcels. When I asked for clarification, he explained that someone had been asking about the process to sell the property. I tried to be reasonable. I offered to sell one parcel to her siblings at market value, but she refused. I even suggested building an additional dwelling unit where they could rent rooms at market rate, about $900 per room. She turned that down too. She called the price ridiculous, insisting that as family, they shouldn't have to pay anything. When I pointed out that they were adults who needed to contribute if they wanted to live here, she accused me of being selfish and cruel. I defended my position, explaining that this land was bought with our daughter's insurance money and was meant for our immediate family, just us and our boys. After consulting with my lawyer, I decided to take action to protect our children's inheritance. I transferred my ownership of the land into a trust with my kids as primary owners. The trust came with specific instructions that only direct descendants of mine could build and live on the property. When my wife found out about the trust, she was livid. She demanded to know how I could do this without telling her. I threw her own actions back at her, pointing out that she had done the same by promising our home to her siblings without consulting me. She tried to argue that it was different because they were family, but I reminded her that our children were family too, and this land was bought with their sister's insurance money. I was simply making sure it stayed in the family. Her siblings started calling and messaging me, calling me selfish and demanding I reverse the trust. I blocked their numbers. My wife threatened to divorce me, but I didn't care. The land was meant for our children, and that's how it would stay. The trust was ironclad. Even if she tried to sell her portion, the restrictions would remain in place. Her siblings couldn't touch it. The house plans were approved by the town hall, and construction began. My wife eventually realized she couldn't win this battle and stopped fighting me on it. Now, whenever the subject of her siblings moving in comes up, I simply point to the trust documents. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Oh,